Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a, uh, an exciting session. Um, <clears throat> I'm Joachim von Braun uh, from the University of Bonn. Um, this uh, session uh, will focus on uh, how to get change done. We want to learn from experience, from good examples, and maybe some bad but mostly good examples, which uh, uh, we want to learn from and, um, and scale them up. Ecologists would like to give soil a voice. Give soil a voice, of course, um, works only indirectly through those who work the soil, farmers. And, um, Social mobilization for change uh, around land degradation requires that uh, uh, soil indirectly gets a voice through farmers. That can come in many different ways. Um, it can come through good political lobbying, it can come through protest movements, the media play an important role. Collective action of farmers at the local level is very important. But fundamentally, it is important that um, uh, the voice of those who work the land is not just uh, speeches and activism, but that it leads to legal change, to organizational change, to law which sets the appropriate incentives so that farmers have the incentives to work the land sustainably. Another important aspect is technology in that context. The technology for communication at the grassroots level and bottom up but also the technologies for sustainable land management. The two need to come together. So, uh, those are some of the, of the basic thoughts which, with which I would like to start this session. Last year, and we don't need to repeat that, we had a very good session on the economics of land degradation. And again, it was revisited in a session on Monday uh, with progress reporting. The economics of land degradation coming from the idea that uh, policymakers need to know the cost of their inaction. And uh, we need to provide them with the information of the cost of action. And uh, the evidence <coughs> is getting stronger and stronger that uh, the cost of action for sustainable land management is much lower than the cost of inaction. And in addition, the evidence is getting stronger and stronger that uh, the cost of inaction entails large inequities, which are not straightforward uh, calculated in cost-benefit uh, ratios, but um, uh, the inequities uh, which arise when, um, when uh, inaction prevails uh, is an additional burden on the poor, the poorest of the poor. We all know that hundreds of millions of people live in the worst degraded areas. As I said, this session will live from the information bottom up. Um, I now see that the room has filled quite suitably. Um, I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, no one misses the movie. Uh, that was the intention of my introductory talk, to uh, fill some, some minutes and get some theory and general perspectives across. Uh, I would like now to ask uh, our technicians uh, to roll out the movie. Ephraim or um, Alicia, is anyone who would like to say some 
remarks about the movie or do we let the movies are you acting in it Ephraim? yes okay <laughs> uh, here's one actor uh, and uh, so uh, let's just see it and um, uh, if there are reactions thereafter we can take a moment but we would like to then move straight into the session i will introduce speakers in their sequence uh, go ahead The economics of land degradation study is trying to answer a very simple question. What is the severity of land degradation? What can be done for the communities, for nations and for the world to take action against land degradation? In our cropland alone, um, we are losing every year up to 20 or some 24 billion tons of soil. Soil is the most valuable uh, geo resource that we have as humanity. It's equivalent to three tons per capita per year. It means the food you, you eat is causing us three tons of soil lost long once for all. We are due to desertification and drought. We are transforming uh, productive land into man-made barren land up to 12 million hectares of land every year. It is equivalent to three times the size of Switzerland or it is equivalent to the size of my country, Benin. It's as if you are taking three times the size of Switzerland out of productivity every year. 1.5 billion people are affected by land degradation worldwide. That's 24% of our entire population. Almost one-fourth of land on our entire planet is degraded over 35 million kilometers squared. The severity of land degradation varies from one region to another, but we see the most severe land degradation in sub-Saharan Africa, especially the area below the, 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 the equator. For instance, in several African countries, gross domestic product is reduced by three to five percent because of land degradation. 17.66 percent of Senegal's land faces degradation, affecting 20 percent of the country's entire population. We are here in uh, the department of Nyoro in the southern part of Senegal. The problem here is about soil erosion. And this soil erosion is a result of Bad practices such as uh, the runoff caused by the reduction of land cover. People are burning the residue of crops and they cut the vegetation. Another cause is when the livestock move across the land, they accelerate degradation soil. And uh, because of the topography, water is taking off fertile parts of the soil. The farmers were collecting all the crop residues, and then they burned it. And then the animals come and trample on the bare soil, all making the way for the water to come and wash away the soil that they have. Why me that? Before the soil erosion, this village had yields of up to three tons per hectare, but now they cannot even reach yields as low as one ton per hectare. The farmers are going to see less yield in the following year because of that process that we saw. So there is the need of having, giving them knowledge on the proper management of, of, of soils, and that's where they can change their, their, their practices. I think what we first need to to understand is the cost of inaction uh, and the benefit of action. It costs money to prevent land degradation. It costs money to remobilize from reverting degraded land into productive land. But um, those costs are much lower than letting a degradation take its course. I think there's still some way to go for the economists 
to get to grips with the multiple benefits of these investments in natural resource management. And if they can do so, we can have, will have better data to convince ministers of finance in each country that it is economically rational to invest in natural resources. 1.34% of Uzbekistan's land faces degradation, affecting 2.22% of the country's entire population. Salinity is a very severe problem. It is more severe in Central Asia than in any other place in the world. Why? It's because it's a dry area and they depend very much on irrigation. So you can see these are the white, these are salt. If you come after two or three days, so this land will be like a, a white, snowed land. The salt is coming out now. This is the salinity. Now it's getting very tough or hard. After three or four days, it will be like a storm. It will uh, negatively affect the yield or plant. There are two major, major uh, areas that uh, one can address the problem of salinity. One is uh, breeding. Uh, there is a breeding program that are done by ICADA uh, to breed for varieties of wheat and other crops that are resistant to, to salinity. Today, we came to the uh, Sidaria province of Uzbekistan to see ecological trial of wheat. Here we have planted 38 varieties of wheat and uh, barley. The checking in this condition, the saline condition, which is, is better. Best one will go to state variety testing condition for, for the uh, releasing of these varieties. In present, 1.1 million hectare a wheat planted in the irrigated area and another 250,000 in the rain fit area. And in our condition, the farmers received more than 7 tons per hectare from this variety. Even uh, shortage of water giving good yield. Well, the Senegal is also suffering from the problem of salinity. But at the same time, they're also taking some actions uh, like planting trees and also drainage system that can drain away salinity and also planting some grasses and other plantations that can also absorb the, the, the salinity that we see. We are here in the valley of Simal, uh, where the big deal is the salinity of the soil. The degree of salinity is uh, higher than the ocean. Nothing can grow in this area. The problem of salinization is a big uh, question. It requires that different partners to be together to fight against it. In total, 700 hectares of land in the Valley of Simal were affected by salinity. However, through the construction of a barrier and other interventions, farmers were able to rehabilitate 500 of these hectares. Somebody tell me, this area, what, what, how different is it from the other area that we just saw? The other side. Yes, this one was uh, as salty as uh, the first one. Okay. But uh, when people intervened, uh -huh. uh, they rehabilitated, okay. and now they they yeah, work they here and they are growing rice. crops, rice okay. especially. And they have actually gone back farming in an area which was abandoned in the past. So it tells us the story that yes, even areas which are no longer usable. They have been abandoned, can be reclaimed, and that's what we saw. Among that, those efforts, I mean, when you're very poor, um, you're trying to find anything that you can invest in that will, you know, reduce your vulnerability and improve your incomes. And so, and it's kind of an obvious, or I mean, it seems kind of an obvious thing to focus on um, natural resource management. The majority of the poor in the world are in rural areas. The majority of them are poor because their assets are underperforming, mean they are degraded. If we really mean that we want to also address food security, then invest in, in, uh, in a way to uh, ensure that we improve the condition of the underperforming asset of the poor will help to uh, address the issue in a much more effective manner. What um, uh, needs to be done at the global level is to 
provides the information where land degradation is particularly negative and to mobilize the resources to address the problem. That means also money, but most importantly to make sure that land rights are assured for poor people, that uh, the uh, water and land use, uh, because water matters a lot for land degradation, are shifted to sustainability. So we need globally strong incentives for sustainable land management. 1.78% of Niger's land faces degradation, affecting 6.61% of the entire population. Niger is a country which is very interesting. It's the poorest country in the world. But it has done something which is very interesting, that it has overcome the problem of land degradation in some areas. And that tells us a very strong story that, well, land degradation can be uh, addressed even among the poorest uh, people in the world. This site, uh, we, call, uh, we call the area here uh, Sake Kwarategi, is a Nkolo department. It was established in March 2005. We introduced uh, some herb species, like some Bokopogon, Andropogon, and some other tree species, uh, like five tree species, Bohinia, Ufesans, Acacia, Senegal, Acacia, Seyal, and many other local species. But um, some of the species, like Geras Senegalensis, are spontaneous. Uh, they, they go here spontaneously. We find them here. We don't produce anything from it. To see the difference between the, the treatment and why we don't do anything. So you see, it's still there. Water runoff is very intense here, whereas all the water that fall is catch within the catchment, the water catchment area. Uh, yeah, this is a hard pan. Yeah, exactly. Here's a hard pan. Here it has been worked. The water is trapped, and the vegetation do grow very well. Regreening by farmers produces multiple impacts. It has a positive impact on crop yields. It has a positive impact on household energy. It has a positive impact on, on uh, the local climate. People in these villages were able to harvest greater fodder for their livestock. And uh, we found on average that that um, had a rate of return. Depending on how you invest, uh, estimated the, the fodder value, the rate of return was at least 28% on average. Could have been as high as 45% on average. Rainfall helps, of course, a process of regreening. But human management of vegetation seems to be a more determining factor for success than rainfall. What is very important, what is very important about this site is uh, the community are so much engaged protecting uh, the, the site. It has a history. Oh. The village is not far. It's less than one kilometer. Okay. Animals do come here. So the villagers agree that uh, for at least two or three seasons, rainy season, no animal will be here. Niger's government has been very supportive of the local population, recognizing that involving the people in decision making is essential in combating the country's land degradation. During the last food crisis in 2011, the government of Niger spent about $25 billion in recuperating lands in the areas where they were most affected. With just little means, they made a lot of effort, and much of the population was involved in this process of recuperating land. This one, they are calling the volunteer trees. They just grow anywhere, but they need protection. If they are not protected against the animals and all that, they, can, they cannot establish themselves uh, to an extent of uh, stopping soil erosion. So this is the case where we have seen the village that we just visited. The farmers were able to protect the trees and they were able to establish a very healthy woodlot. Farmer managed natural regeneration. In the last two decades or so, more than five million hectares of land has been regenerated. And it has had implication in food security of the population, their resilience to uh, climatic shock, and at the same time, it has improved the water table. A, a woman told me that, sir, you know, 10 years ago, I used to work almost a full day to fetch water. Nowadays, I need not to, to, to have such burden. 
most important asset that most people have in developing countries is their land. Let that use every acre of land the best way possible. I think the world should care much more about land degradation than it actually does. Why do we care about poverty in Africa? You know, because Probably because I don't like living in a world where people are going to bed hungry at night, you know. And I would like to quote um, a British environmental journalist, Geoffrey Lean. Mankind is ten inches from oblivion. So, stress emphasizing the point, we are really dependent on soil fertility. It's not dirt, it's soil. In fact, someone says that the worm that is actually uh, working at, uh, in the soil is so important that in every city we need to build some status and some statue to the, to the worm to celebrate their work and express our acknowledgement to, 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 you know, to them. Unless we adequately manage soil fertility, there will mm -hmm. be little future for, for, the, for the world population. Public showing of this movie yeah. was it? Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't seen it. Um, it's um, uh, there are other actors here in the room. Uh, somebody will speak in a moment. Um, it's good to know that uh, some of these academics uh, try to get into uh, mass communication. It was also good to see some of the old pioneers on the land degradation uh, research. Uh, including, uh, let me say a word on John Pender. Uh, uh, Dr. Pender, 20 years ago, started work on the economics of land degradation in Ethiopia and Uganda. Actually, it was a project funded by your ministry, uh, Dr. Schmitz, um, uh, at IFRI, which uh, in those days was absolutely pioneering uh, in uh, uh, creating bottom-up information on why farmers are forced to do what they do to their land. Um, and uh, it has changed, I think, uh, uh, the insights, for instance, in Ethiopia, we will hear about Ethiopia in a moment, without that work, um, which was very carefully monitored by senior leadership in the Ethiopian government, um, I cannot imagine that today's massive investment in uh, sustainable land management, for instance, in Ethiopia would have come about, which GIZ is now following up on in an exemplary way. So that much uh, on my comment on the movie. Um, Alicia, I think you are um, the first speaker with a brief overview. Um, ten minutes, no more. Uh, Alicia Mizabayev, a senior researcher at the um, Center for Development Research. Is originally from Uzbekistan, and um, he plays a key role in uh, co-coordinating uh, with uh, uh, Ephraim Konya a major research effort on uh, the economics of land degradation. Uh, Alicia, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you have been. Uh, as inspired as me from these images from the field. But now I would like to invite you to other dimension of our work, uh, talking about uh, methods and concepts of uh, how we can do similar uh, sim uh, national case studies, global assessment for economics of land degradation. Uh, first, uh, during the last uh, two days we have seen, and we are, all, we are all aware that land degradation is a very important global problem, and, uh, but efforts so far to address it have not been uh, adequate. Uh, 
So what's lacking in our view is a policy framework uh, which is based on evidence, on evidence and uh, uh, good science. And the major objective of this uh, global assessment and national case studies is to provide for such a framework. And uh, here I would like to introduce to your attention this uh, methods paper, which has uh, been uh, finalized recently after a very rigorous international uh, interdisciplinary peer review. It's also available on the on the back side on the table, which uh, provides, which is meant to provide uh, a guidance uh, for uh, conducting. Uh, harmonized and feasible uh, case studies. Here I would like to uh, emphasize on these two bold words, harmonized and feasible. Harmonized because uh, there have been a lot of previous studies on land degradation, including by John Pander, Ifpri, many other authors. Uh, one of the things uh, which were missing in those studies, all of them were having different methodologies, different uh, uh, approaches. So when we want to compare them, to draw meaningful conclusions about them, uh, of course they are useful, uh, but uh, usefulness could be increased by having some kind of standard, harmonized methods uh, for assessment. And also these should be feasible uh, methods for conducting in different areas. So the research questions uh, the ELD and this uh, research wants to answer are three. What are the causes of land degradation, why land degradation is happening. Second uh, question is, what is the cost, not only economic, but also social, environmental cost of land degradation? And uh, finally, importantly, what we can do about it, how we can, what are the policies we can offer to solve, uh, to catalyze action against land degradation? And uh, all this research so far shows that in most cases, taking action against land degradation is uh, cheaper than doing nothing, ultimately. And it's, it has much more economic benefits to do something about language language to address it. And the conceptual framework uh, uh, for uh, this ELD economics of land degradation is uh, presented here. Uh, you, must have, you, may, you may have seen this many times uh, in our previous publications. Uh, we look at, uh, and this conceptual framework also reflects the research questions we are asking. Uh, what are the causes, proximate, underlying causes? Uh, proximate causes are related with topography, climate, unsustainable land management, but what's uh, most important, what's the real co underlying causes which are leading to those effects on land education, like land tenure, market access, government policies, government effectiveness, so other aspects. So they lead to different levels of land degradation with effects on not only uh, direct on-site effects, but also off-site effects, effects on ecosystem services, and other, many other three dimensions on economy, society, environment. So all the conceptual framework and analysis should take into account all this comprehensive uh, cost of land degradation using total economic value approach. <coughs> there have been no, no studies before on economics of uh, uh, degradation. We're looking only at the uh, on-site cost, direct cost, those which are easier. But what we are emphasizing, we should not ignore the ecosystem values of uh, land as well. So, uh, the, coming to, from the concept to the research agenda, uh, we would like to uh, suggest that the research agenda should be divided into two uh, big parts. Uh, first one is the core component, which for, for be, uh, to be able to compare across case studies, to draw meaningful conclusions, uh, case studies should follow some core, standard, harmonized research methods. And uh, in these activities, uh, we are following two specific lines of research. First, identify the causes of land degradation at different levels, different scales, so that we can triangulate, compare at different scales. And also by economic modeling of action versus inaction to identify what's the cost of land degradation. And also this is uh, not only economic modeling, by economic means interdisciplinary, soil scientists, crop modelers, there will be presentations on these aspects later on to the, uh, in the morning. And also this modeling allows us to test uh, scenarios for policy action. Uh, here I would like to emphasize that uh, land degradation problems are very complex and uh, it requires some serious uh, science. There are no easy or casual sh short shortcuts to uh, address this problem. So these core methods 
uh, are uh, are meant to be to provide this uh, minimum standards for uh, conducting case studies. But this is not enough. In all countries, there are issues which are very specific to those that have very high importance. So the, uh, there is a need for desirable or even sophisticated methods that do not need to be exactly the same all across the case studies, but uh, they will seek to address locally specific important issues uh, using uh, sometimes very uh, uh, good interdisciplinary, uh, cutting edge interdisciplinary research. For example, uh, some of the uh, <coughs> lines of such research we are thinking to follow, like fertilizer subsidies and land degradation in India. As today we heard, this is a very huge topic, it needs, and policymakers need to have uh, hard evidence to make decisions on these issues. <coughs> land degradation and food security in Kenya, or uh, input. Market liberalization and how it's affecting uh, land degradation and people in uh, Uzbekistan and similarly for other uh, case studies. So uh, this map shows the areas where the case studies uh, are conducted. Uh, these case studies were not selected haphazardly. There is a sampling framework uh, which has led to it. And the red ones are those where we are going into in-depth ground level work uh, case studies. But does it mean that uh, only these countries should do case studies? Absolutely no. This framework will uh, calls for, invites all other countries as well to do their case studies, to include more case studies, because the more case studies we have, uh, the more accurate our results, uh, especially for drawing global conclusions. So using uh, uh, the, this framework here uh, can provide, uh, as a, can serve as a toolbox for other case studies as well. Our colleagues from uh, natural sciences can also be interested in this representativeness of these case studies in terms of biomes. As we can see from this map, uh, these case studies uh, represent rel quite well all the different biomes we have around the world, especially in those areas, what, as we will see from a presentation in the morning, where land degradation hotspots uh, with land degradation hotspots. So, uh, what are the plant outputs? Uh, conceptual paper. Here you can uh, take it, and then global mapping of land degradation hotspots, which will this is a ongoing work, which will be presented by uh, my colleague Bao uh, Quang Lo from uh, uh, Vietnam and ETH, and then the empirical modeling, uh, crop modeling, how and modeling of different management options, which will be presented by Ho Yang Kwan later on today. And then technical discussion papers on the case studies, and we will have presentations from our colleagues from countries, case study countries, on the ongoing work on case studies. But uh, technical discussion papers are not enough. We want uh, also to reach uh, to uh, to reach out to policymakers, policy briefs, or other larger society. Yesterday there was a uh, discussion that uh, these policy briefs, this discussion should be uh, very uh, with the right language. Uh, the language of New York uh, to reach to uh, to make change uh, to make a change there, uh, but uh, I would also say language of New York is very crucially important. But that's not enough. We not we also need to speak the language of Nairobi, language of Santiago, language of Berlin, and language of New Delhi. So these policy briefs uh, are meant to uh, convey locally important but globally also important issues to each to policymakers in these countries. A documentary video and also all the data generated will be uh, available online depending on of course all the different data sharing agreements and also uh, final results uh, will be summarized in the publication and uh, finally I would like to uh, indicate some of the, our uh, partners all around the world but the most important thing here is that this is a very open inclusive uh, Effort. So all uh, these partnerships are expanding, and all partners are welcome to join and uh, uh, participate in this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alicia. Uh, uh, I think it was helpful to uh, uh, to get your message. Um, let me underline one point. Um, uh, who are we that we uh, uh, suggest uh, setting standards for case studies? Um, we cannot do this alone. Um, 
uh, it needs uh, to be based on uh, solid peer review and that's what this um, document has been exposed to. Um, the chair of the review committee uh, of this work is uh, Professor Lal, Ratan Lal, who is here at the conference. Um, the other reviewer was, uh, peer reviewer was uh, Professor Hassan, uh, to many of you known as uh, a key writer in the global ecosystems assessment uh, strategy, the leading um, uh, economic uh, ecologist uh, from Africa, from the University of Pretoria and uh, Cape Town, and Professor Nelson, who uh, works closely with, uh, um, with Gretchen Daly from Stanford University, the big promoter, if not inventor, of uh, nature capital. So, um, it was an arduous peer review process. I didn't just sign off on it. Uh, it took about half a year of back and forth. The co-authors of the paper know what I'm talking about. But they have signed off on this document. And uh, I think for you it's important to know that this process was uh, in there. The world remains, of course, a free place. Anyone can do uh, uh, whatever case study he or she would like to do. But uh, maybe implicitly, uh, we don't have any sticks uh, uh, this uh, framework will advance research to make its coherent contribution to the land degradation policy. Um, now we have uh, four papers on Africa and um, I suggest we move on uh, with them and then maybe come back to discussions later on because uh, that's the core of the issue. Samba So will come first. Please come forward. Uh, do you have a PowerPoint also? Uh, okay. Uh, Samba is from the National Research Institute of Soils in Senegal. You saw him act in the movie. Um, and uh, he has been involved for many years in uh, research on uh, sustainable soil and land management. Somebody has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you like that too? Thank you. I want to ask you first to excuse my combination, it's even not very good. Uh, I'm going to share some information about land degradation in Senegal. Uh, the first point will be the types of uh, land degradation and the extension. And uh, from uh, a report conducted by World Bank, the phenomenon affects two-thirds part of the land, uh, arable lands, it means about two millions of hectares. Another report uh, tells that uh, the phenomenon extension is about 34%. And here we see that the land degradation is extended in all over the six agroecological zones and we are we have three main types of land degradation uh, soil erosion caused by wind uh, water erosion and salinization and uh, these are reported in all over the six uh, uh, agroecological zones and the amount is about two million and a half hectares and the uh, widespread uh, type of land degradation is water erosion as shown here in the movies uh, we have shown and I'm going to talk about the impacts of the land degradation uh, the one of them is the decrease of the productivity uh, and this is shown in the fall of the contribution to agriculture in the GDP. And this phenomenon is uh, regular since uh, 96 to nowadays. And this graphic shows that how the weight of uh, agriculture in the GDP is going down. And uh, according to a report of World Bank, uh, the phenomenon uh, is an equivalent of one person of the GDP of the country in uh, 2007. Other uh, evaluations show that it can be about five 
and uh, half percent of the GDP in uh, 2000 due to the soil nutrient depletion. Another, another evaluation so that the value of the lost production in the primary sector is about two and, uh, four and a half percent of the GDP in uh, 2000. Another kind of uh, uh, negative impact is uh, food insecurity. In Senegal, the decline of uh, productivity uh, has uh, made the, uh, the, the country faces uh, food dependency. <clears throat> About 40% of the country's need of cereals uh, are imported in Senegal. Such year, year, each year. For example, for the rice, 70 hundreds of thousands of tons are annually imported. And then the Senegal is uh, in a dependency of, uh, of food. Uh, and other products are, are imported also. Another negative impact of land degradation is the rural exodus. Uh, People are leaving uh, the rural areas and go to the, the cities because agriculture is now uh, don't, don't cover their needs and it doesn't give uh, wealth. And these have negative consequences in rural areas such as the decline of the agricultural labor. Uh, different actors give some responses about uh, land degradation and some of them are public measures. First of all, the Senegal has uh, ratified the UNCCD uh, in the early year of 1994 and has developed a national action plan. Um, different uh, measures were taken as such as legal measures, institutional measures, and policy measures. Uh, I would give a, 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 I'm going to give a, an example of institutional measures, that is the creation of my, my office. My office was created in, 90, in 2004 because the phenomenon of land degradation has increased and, and becomes a great threat and then the government take the decision to implement a national institute to focus its work on land degradation. Other actors have given some responses, uh, such as NGOs and populations themselves. The populations are actually involved in the fight against land degradation. They have better organization, uh, organization now and they are uh, improving their skill uh, about uh, the fight of land degradation. <coughs> and in this table, I want to show the commitment of the government to fight against land degradation through our public investment. This table shows that uh, there is an important part of the public investment affected to the primary sector and the rate is about 22 and a half percent and some projects are implemented some of them have uh, success and others have uh, less success some of uh, success stories are uh, reforestation by Kajuarina in the coastal area which is affected by uh, wind erosion and uh, this project is on about uh, 900, uh, 9,000 of hectares and in the coastal area which is, which is length is about uh, 7,000 of uh, kilometers and we have uh, uh, throughout this uh, this project, too many benefits classified in socio-economics, in uh, ecological and in cultural benefits. 
to another project uh, which is successfully conducted with a sustainable land management pilot project which uh, was uh, located in the center of the country. I would, uh, I'm going to emphasize in these agroecological zones, which is in the center of the country, and that concentrates the, all of the types of land degradation. Because in this area, there were, for a longer time, monoculture of uh, groundnuts, because it's called uh, ground basin. We found that maximum of land degradation because uh, that's why the, the, the project was implemented there. And uh, in uh, eight on the, uh, community, uh, rural communities, we have good uh, results about this, uh, this project. And what is uh, important to mention in the project is that it, uh, it increases the dialogue between, between local actors, such as the people, the producers, the NGOs, the local authorities, the, the technical services locally based in these uh, in these uh, uh, rural communities. Join the the, the efforts. To, to, to fight against the, the, the land degradation in the area. Uh, I, to finish, I would like to emphasize in soil salinity, which is a, a big concern in the, in, in the country. We have seen it in the, in the video, and uh, it affects too much land. Some reports say that it's about 45% of our <coughs> lands and it's located in some strategic zones where uh, <coughs> farmers are, are, are working. And uh, something has been done uh, through our projects. projects uh, dams are, are constructed to fight against the water, uh, the water uh, invasion in, in Arab lands. And other technologies are, are, are implemented to fight against that, uh, that, uh, that issue. But what is to be mentioned is all of these interventions are at a small scale. And uh, the, the, uh, the challenge here is to upscale these interventions before this uh, uh, phenomenon is gaining too much. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. It, it shows how important it is that countries create dedicated institutions where dedicated <coughs> people can, can flourish uh, for the long run. Any quick question to uh, Samba? Um, a question or two? Well, yeah, okay, let me come to you and say who you are. Cesar Morales, my name, uh, from McClack and GIC. Um, the losses that it refers, refers to global value product or agricultural value product. Okay. And the difference between the both evaluation, the nutrient depletion and the Impact, economic impacts. How can we explain or you know, find an explanation for the difference? Some the question was uh, uh, clear to you. Um, what do you mean? Are, are these uh, global value products, uh, GDPs for Senegal, losses, and so on? Uh, the two reports uh, does not intervene in the same time. The first one was uh, uh, in 2000, and uh, it's related to the rate, to the cost of uh, uh, land degradation in GDP in 2000, due to the loss of the nutrient factor right. in the soil, and uh, the later one is uh, 
from the World Bank in 2007, so at the same time, in 2007, and it's related to the, the cost of land degradation in all land degradation in the GDP. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's important that we uh, square these things. Uh, uh, please, can you give the lady a Thank you. My name is Ekla Ntawea from Southern African Research and Documentation Centre. I'm interested to know uh, for how long has the, the new species been introduced in the degraded land uh, to, to, to see if there are any associated or indirect impacts with the, uh, the indigenous trees around. Okay. Thank you. What was the question? Please. Yes. I, I'm really worried that um, up to 40% of the land area, Cotivolo land area is um, affected by uh, salinity. It's, it's a huge, huge um, a problem in Senegal. Uh, what we'd like to know, what is the extent of the international contribution from the international community? And then what's, what's the um, um, percentage of um, um, budgetary allocation from from government, you know, to 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 address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, for the trees uh, planted, uh, fine again to fight against uh, the land degradation. Uh, They, they, they were planted in the years of, uh, since 1970. And uh, because of, uh, because people are, are, are intervening sometime to, in cutting this, that, uh, that, uh, these, these trees, and because of the fact of the, the species are, are older, uh, another project intervened to to rehabilitate that uh, that band of uh, of, of Kajarina, uh, to, to in order to, to stop the, the, the dunes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, the result is is, is spectacular. If if there if 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 not. Uh, if you haven't uh, this band of of, of Kaziarina, uh, some valleys where uh, agriculture is taken is made will not be possible. Will will be uh, invaded by by sun, and this uh, is an, an important uh, an important uh, result uh, that, that we have. I don't know. If mm -hmm. I, That's okay. And how did your re reaction to what was done about salinity? <laughs> yes, salinity is a, is a good question. We are intervening, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, the intervention is very very small. Okay. Yeah. On a small scale, people are intervening. Some some projects are taking place, but there are small projects. Funded by NGOs and uh, some partners in, in, each, in, 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 in a small scale. That's why uh, studies are, 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 are made to, to, to see how to, 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 how to intervene and how to get food to fight against that, that, that issue. So it's, a, it's, it's a big question. Okay. Thank you. Well, you pointed at an unresolved issue. I, I don't want to, we have to come back to this. Um, uh, maybe looking across various case studies, um, I thought we warmed up with Senegal. 
Uh, I very much like your comparison of successes and flops or failures. And we need to understand both better. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, the well-known Ephraim Konya uh, uh, from the earlier movie. Ephraim uh, is a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute um, and he comes from East Africa. Um, Ephraim, uh, uh, you will speak now uh, on your beloved country Niger, uh, although you come far away from uh, Tanzania, uh, bordering Kenya. Um, uh, your uh, colleague uh, uh, Bukar is, uh, is not here today. I also uh, hand over to you this session after you have spoken. Please watch the time better than I did. Um, and uh, uh, I have to step out to go to another session, but I will be back then uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you. I like the video very, at very last uh, session where I jumped. I didn't know that guy took that video, so it was very interesting to see it. Now, talking about Niger. Uh, this is a country which we have known for a long time. First of all, it has been the least developed country for more than five years in a row. That's one fact. At the same time, we have been telling stories, success story from Niger, that all oh, they have been regreening of the Sahel. But there is new evidence that the sun is rising in Niger. There are changes. And what are these changes? A report that was released by IFPRI only last week is showing that Niger is no longer the most, the hungriest country in the world. If you look at the global hunger index, it's going down progressively and consistently. If you look at the infant mortality rate, it's also going down <coughs> consistently. Now, we can be able to link the story that we have been telling. There is a success story in Niger and we are seeing the impact on the human welfare. What's going on? Why? Can we explain this uh, positive change? And uh, one of the things that we need to look at is the government effectiveness. If you're building a house, and you build that house on a sand land, that house is gonna be washed away by the flood. There was a president in this country who was denying that there is no uh, hunger in the country while people were dying. And that's something which uh, is coming from the fact that the governance sometimes, and in most of the cases, it affects very much the human welfare and development uh, program that can uh, improve. Now, if you look at the govern government effectiveness, it ranges from the minus 2.5, which is the weakest government, uh, to 2.5, which is the strongest government. You can see there is a progressive rise of the government effectiveness toward the positive. It has not reached yet the positive side, but we are seeing there are good changes. That can be associated, not 100%, uh, but we can associate such changes to the improvement that we are seeing here. And the other thing is about the amount of money that the government is investing in uh, agri the agricultural sector. It has been consistently also rising, and we see that there is a rise, although there was, uh, because of the, the, the problem that we, uh, the rest of the, the world has been experiencing, there was a decline here. But there has been a, a, an increase of the agricultural expenditure as, as percent of the agricultural GDP. And also in terms of national agricultural investment, the countries are allocating uh, the total of the national agricultural investment, we see that it is investing very much in the natural resource management. But immediately we see there is a problem. There isn't much investment in marketing. There isn't much in, in subsidies. No subsidies, which is a good thing for, well, for eco economists like me. But there is a problem here that there is no investment in marketing, and that's something which, uh, as I'll show in the, the other uh, session that we're going to have, is a very big problem. If you invest only here, 
in natural resource management and irrigation, that's a very dry country, or almost about 75% uh, of the area is, uh, is very dry. So irrigation is very important. There isn't much investment here, but all these ones, they are starting and ending our production. Nothing is invested in marketing. And that's something which uh, is, 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 a, is a problem. Saying that, well, we are seeing su the sun is rising, but we still have a lot of challenges in this country. Niger, uh, the area planted, planted, not natural forest, the area planted has been increasing. And that's something which is very good because of the, the planting and the regreening of the soil that we have been seeing. That also is telling us a story that the, 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 the positive um, impact that we are seeing can be uh, supported by a lot of uh, programs that the government has been promoting. But one thing we should know is that the government is not actually giving money to the people to plant the trees. As we saw, there is no subsidy. But the government created rules that we are giving tree tenure to the people who can plant trees or protect trees. Those trees belong to them as long as they planted the trees or they protected trees on their own farm. And that created an incentive that Joachim said in the morning that, well, give incentives to the farmers. They are very smart, very good economists. They are going to do uh, something which uh, you want them to do as long as there is an incentive. Um, now, what has been the cost of land degradation? Uh, we, we did this study at the early stage of this study and we saw that about 80% of uh, the GDP in the country is lost each year because of land degradation. But as you can see, there are some improvements that are, are going to be very, very important uh, to make sure that we reverse this uh, situation. And there are also still challenges. If you look at uh, decentralization, which is very important actually, uh, to ensure that uh, we have uh, uh, sustainable land management, giving the, um, uh, the mandate of the, to the people to do what they want. You saw the, uh, the, the interview that we had with the, the Minister of Environment. He said a lot of things, but the most important and very important thing that he said was give mandate to the people to do what they are supposed to be doing. And this is what we are seeing here, that decentralization helps very much to allow the farmers, to allow the land users to do what they are supposed to do. We did a study in four countries, Uganda, Nigeria, and Kenya. And we were looking at uh, the local bylaws that are enacted by the villages, not by the central government, not by the parliament, by the local government, about soil and uh, uh, soil sustainable land and water management. And we saw that the number of bylaws are enacted in each of the villages was declining from Uganda as you go to Niger. And we looked, we, we tried to associate that with the level of decentralization. There was a study which was done by the World Bank by Ndegwa, and we saw there was a very strong relationship between the degree of decentralization and the number of bylaws that are enacted in each of the villages. You can see that. And Niger is the last country that we saw in these uh, four countries, which the, the, degree of, uh, the, the degree of decentralization was the lowest. So we still have a problem in Niger, even though the sun is rising, we are seeing a lot of positive changes, but still there are many challenges that need to be addressed. And also, if you look at the GDP, uh, the GDP has consistently been increasing, but if you look at the per capita the GDP, it is declining, because Niger has the highest uh, reproductive rate in the world. It's quite high. And uh, this is something is tell, telling us that, well, there are positive changes, but still there are many challenges that uh, need to be addressed. And uh, we also compared the red rate of adoption of different uh, land management practices between Kenya and Niger. Those two countries are quite different, but it just tells you a story that, well, the, le the, the level of uh, adoption in Niger still is very high compared to other countries like uh, Kenya and others. And that, again, tells us that there is a very big challenge, challenge about uh, building markets and also uh, the, the decentralization and other, other aspects. All those things need to be addressed as we talk about the policies, as we talk about the things that need to be done to enhance the success that we have seen from Niger. And I would like to end here and invite questions.
Do we have any, maybe a couple of questions before we can come to the next uh, presenter? Ah, Judy? The sun is rising in each year. Yeah. I don't know whether, I'm sure you are aware <clears throat> that Niji has struck oil. There's oil, petroleum. Yeah. And that's why, one of the reasons why things are changing. And I think in the next five years, the Niger you are seeing today is going to be entirely a different place. No subsidy to, <coughs> subsidy is not given to farmers because these resources are not available. The concentration right now is on natural resource management because the area is highly vulnerable. Otherwise, it's going to go into extinction. So I think it's, it's understandable. What I want to suggest is that you, you, the international community should remain committed and close to Niger because it's a country that will move positively, it's a country that will listen to interventions from organizations like yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that comment. One more comment. A question? Thank you. And we have a question here concerning um, the government effectiveness index. It obviously underlines the importance that we need to talk to policy decision makers in the context of land degradation there. Um, could you elaborate with two, three sentences maybe, Ephraim, what the government effectiveness index is based on? Do you, if you have any could, could oh, yeah. just two, three details or so? Well, the, the government effectiveness is an index that measures how effective the government is. Mm -hmm. How are the decisions, decisions made? Are they made influenced by the, the, the elite capture? Are the rural laws followed? And uh, are the people involved in the decision making? That, that's an important aspect that uh, the Minister of Environment emphasized. And uh, if are the people listened to by the government? And, uh, are the rule, rules that are set by the government enforced? And are they, are they accepted to, by the people? So that, in general, is the government effectiveness, which is a very good indicator of how effective the government is. And I didn't have much time, but I wanted to compare two countries in Africa. The country with the, one of the highest uh, government effectiveness in the, in the region is Botswana. 90% of the area in Botswana is a desert. And then compare that with DRC Congo. DRC Congo government effectiveness is, the, is the among the lowest in the region and in the world. 30% of carbon stock in Africa is in DRC Congo. 15% of the fresh water is in DRC Congo. If you look at the Global Hunger Index, and, uh, DRC Congo, is the second or the third from the, the bottom. Why are the people starving outside a big silo of resource? Government effectiveness is the first thing that we can look at. Botswana is among the highest uh, in terms of uh, nutrition in the, in the region. And 90% of the region of the country is a desert. What is the difference between those two countries? Government effectiveness. Okay, so we should have uh, move on to the next uh, presenter, who is Oliver, please. I'm a doctoral student at the Center for Development Research, um, that is SEF. Um, my doctoral <coughs> studies, my thesis is on economics of land degradation in the Eastern African region. Um, I'm on the very initial stages of, of, of writing my work, and what I want to present today is a quick overview of uh, the extent of land degradation in, in the region, uh, some of the documented drivers or causes of land degradation, and just a quick uh, overview again on cost and consequences in this region. 
as a way of introduction, we there is a consensus in the Eastern African region that land degradation remains as serious threats to the livelihoods, even though we don't have the exact um, we don't have a consensus on the exact, uh, the exact uh, extent and severity, and as well as the impact of land degradation in the region. We know that the resource loss due to land degradation are enormous in this region. The more recent map that we we have uh, by Fleck and and, and and his colleagues is that 27% uh, of land area in Sub-Saharan Africa is, is subject to degradation. And, and I'm, I'm happy because Bao is here and he will be presenting probably later on uh, issues on, on, on this and he will give a reflection and an upgrade, I mean uh, an update on the map later on. But again, some of the widespread uh, types of land degradation processes is water and wind erosion. We saw in the video in the Western African part and this is also similar to the Eastern African part. Uh, this is the map I was talking about, giving us an, a short overview of, uh, of uh, the land degradation hotspots in this region. I don't want to belabor on this much because later on, I guess, uh, Bao will be giving a, a, an, a, an updated map on this. But the red spots are the ones that are reporting uh, degradation uh, trends. And if I may just say something about that, I would... Uh, I would wish to reflect on the Eastern African part, and as you can see, uh, the map of Kenya, which I had an indicator here, uh, in, in this uh, part of Kenya, we see along the Rift Valley, the western part of the country, is showing a trend in degradation. Same part, the southern part of Tanzania, as well as uh, the western part of Ethiopia, and the northern part of Ethiopia, and, and as well as also to the eastern part of Malawi. Those are the hotspot areas that uh, I will be carrying my study to identify whether there are significant drivers or causes in this in, in this uh, in these regions. And as Alicia presented in his first uh, paper on the methodological approaches, there are two sets of drivers that, of course, have been identified to cause uh, land degradation in this uh, in, uh, globally. And in this region, the proximate drivers are topography. These are common across the the, the borders and have been documented in several studies in this region, we have topography and sustainable agricultural practices of grazing and deforestation. But also the key underlying drivers are poverty, insecure land tenure, population pressure, as, as, as de depicted by demographic growth. We also have uh, deforestation, lack of alternative energy sources, that's why most people are, are, are deforesting huge parts of, 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 of land. Or forest. But key again is the weak institutional and regulatory environment in the agricultural sector across borders in, this, in these countries. Uh, there is no exact consensus on, on, on some of these factors. For instance, um, in some literature we find that poverty is uh, a positive driver to land degradation, that poor households tend to degrade their lands more. But also some studies uh, give indication that poor households that own, have land only as the only resource will be more careful to take care of their own land and, and therefore they, are, they tend to invest more on this uh, uh, productive uh, resource and, and therefore we're going into a deep assessment to, 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 to really um, provide the exact magnitude and direction of causality between uh, such factors, uh, underlying factors in a framework, in an econometric and robust econometric framework later on. Um, some of the documented effects, productivity effects of land degradation uh, as, as provided in the literature so far is that in Ethiopia, for example, about a billion tons of topsoil is lost annually. And in Kenya, the losses by soil and water, I mean soil by water erosion, was reported at about 72 tons per hectare per year. And in Tanzania, it was even high. In the, six, in the 1960s, it was about 105 tons per hectare per year, but this increased to about 224 uh, tons per hectare in the, in the period of 1980s and early 2000. Salinization is not only a problem in the western part of Africa, it is also a serious uh, issue in the eastern African region, especially in the irrigated um, uh, croplands. About 30% uh, of irrigated land was lost in Kenya due to salinization, and about 27% in Tanzania. Some of the uh, documented evidence on cropped yield losses due to erosion or land degradation is that 
it, it, it ranges about 2 to 40 percent in this region, and a mean of 6.2 in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Malawi re, uh, reported serious uh, losses or of about 4 to 11 percent for specific crops. And in Tanzania, fields that had more, uh, in Tanzania yields were about 30 percent more in areas that didn't have serious erosion. And in terms of poverty and food security effects, uh, documented evidence also showed that uh, because of the increasing population and because of the dependence on agricultural lands and uh, the decline in productivity due to erosion and due to degradation, we, we, are, we, are yet to, we, we, we are going to experience even a bigger challenge in the coming, in the coming years, not unless we are able to address some of these issues. Um, we see that about 20% of the population in 30 African countries were undernourished earlier on by the, by the end of 1990s and chronic hunger was reported in over 35% of the population in 18 countries and this includes countries in the Eastern African region and malnutrition was expected even to increase by, by an average of about 32% in most of these countries again due to degradation of, of, result, I mean, of, of, of the productive capacity of the land uh, one, what I would wish to say about uh, increase, in, increase in poverty is that about 73% of rural population currently are residing in marginally and degrading lands. That is, that is, that, that, that is a very serious uh, issue that we need to look into, especially because then this population depends on land as the only resource they have, the source of their livelihood. And the overall losses that so far have been reported, like we saw in... Um, in Senegal and, and, and in Benin, and, and sorry, in Niger, Ethiopia, the annual cost of land degradation was estimated at about 3% of the agricultural uh, domestic, uh, gross domestic product. And in Malawi, ranging from 9, about 10% to 11% of the, uh, uh, of the GDP. So far, in terms of sustainable land management practices, the adoption rates are still very low in Africa, about only 3%. A report by the World Bank shows that about 3% of the total cropland is under SLM. And some of the pay, uh, serious barriers that have been uh, documented to, 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 to inhibit or constrain the adoption of uh, SLM are technological, knowledge-based, institutional, and even policy barriers that we need to address. Some of them, for instance, is the knowledge gaps on specific land degradation and SLM issues by farmers and lack of local level capacities and experiences. Some of the farmers uh, would not be able to, to understand how much of their land is degraded, even though uh, they, they continue producing and yields are going low, but then they don't have the capacity to tell how much of their land is really severely degraded or going through the degradation process. And in general, poverty and lack of resources uh, to buy some of the key inputs and to replenish some of the lost resources is another issue. What I would wish to say as an implication of, of my findings in this, at this stage is that uh, we need to address land tenure problems in, 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 in the Eastern African region because then it gives the farmers the impetus to, to really go into um, sustainable uh, production in their farms. And some of the SLM practices that are already successful, like legume, maize legume intergrouping, crop rotation, should be encouraged and should be scaled up. And preservation of forest resources and reforestation should be key because then when we lose lots of forest to, 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 due to uh, deforestation, more of that land will then be degraded again. And where will we go next? Because then when we lose, uh, when, when farmers have lost capacity to, to improve their own lands, they tend to get into, into, the, into, into new frontiers by deforesting some of the uh, lands. And again, as, as, a, as a final point, I wish to say that some of the disincentives and barriers to adoption and uh, uptake of SLM should be addressed. For instance, give farmers more information, and we need to improve the extension capacity in the rural areas and in the villages. And we need to address also the financial and capital barriers to access of uh, inputs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. If I can just say, if I had, uh, one comment because we are running out of time. Do you have any comment on Oliver's presentation? Mm -hmm.
Yes. Um, thanks, Oliver, uh, for uh, actually um, sharing with us your initial findings. Um, when it comes to actually literature search, uh, particularly when it comes to the case in my country, the literature is full of actually information that has been cited over the past two, three decades. And mostly, the literature does reflect the current reality where Ethiopia is also becoming a leading example of community-empowered land rehabilitation work. We don't have much data on that. Many researchers do not actually work on that, so they keep on actually quoting the past work. Maybe my colleague from GIZ might also talk. In terms of SLM, best, best, best activities are actually coming up, but in relation to what has been said with respect to salinity, I can say we are nowhere. But mind you, in terms of salinity, we also are actually the most affected in Africa, actually the largest, uh, and we stand actually first. Therefore, I wish you could also go deeper and take like some data and in yourself so that you could also see what changes are taking place at the moment. Thank you very much. Actually, my comment goes in the very same direction. I was wondering whether you could, uh, in your research, include uh, the involvement and participation of the communities as a success factor or determining factor for adoption of uh, SLM practices. Very briefly, Oliver. Right. Um, thank you for. for, for the two comments that uh, 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 from you, um, really, yes, it's uh, this work is at very, very early stages. I would say this is uh, draft number zero. We, we, we're just starting up. And I've, I've given a copy and I've even indicated not to be quoted because there are a lot of things that we need to, to include more and, and, and more assessment. But I will take that seriously and I will look into, into the aspects that you're saying. And we are also pursuing partnerships in Ethiopia and we would wish to see uh, if we could get information that yet is not published and it can come to our light, it would be very interesting. And um, and, 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 and thank you. Uh, we will we'll look into these aspects of SLM and, and various aspects that you mentioned. Sorry, Ifra, just just a short one. In your case, so for your for your now for the work you intend to do, yes, uh, where exactly is going to be? You know, where, which country? Where are you going to take your case study? The review overview you've given covers the whole of East Africa. So where are you zeroing in? Um, first of all, we are in the first uh, research question that we postulated is where are the hotspots in this in the, in the region? And um, based on the work that Bao and his colleagues have done, we've identified some portions along the. Um, in, in the Eastern African countries and based on data availability we are yet to narrow down into a specific part of, of, the, of, the, of the Eastern African uh, countries. Yeah, so pr most probably Ethiopia and Tanzania because then we have some, some work happening in Kenya already. So I can't, I can't specifically say which part is, is, is of now but it will be one of those, one of, of the two countries in the Eastern African region. Thank you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite uh, Wellington to come and speak. Wellington comes uh, to us from the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute uh, in Nairobi, and he's going to speak about the case study in Kenya. Yeah, I hear that we have got to gain ground, so I'll skip a lot of stuff so that we can gain ground. So, um, land deg degradation is a serious issue in Kenya. Some of these statistics have been mentioned, so I will not repeat. 
but I would like to say that a conservative figure is that um, over 10 million people are affected by land degradation. And, and I say that is very conservative because um, uh, there are many more people who are affected by uh, this land degradation issue. So the red spots are mainly where we have a serious land degradation and uh, those are the areas that we need to make sure that uh, we do something about. Um, moving on, what are the causes of degradation? And I want to say that um, a lot of this has been uh, mentioned. The only thing is that I will say uh, one of the major uh, drivers of um, land degradation is uh, exactly what the graph is trying to show. Uh, you can see that uh, we have been um, increasing grain production by increasing or extending uh, the land under production. That is not a very good picture because you want uh, yields to go up while you even reduce the amount of land that you require for cereal production. So this is one of, a one of the major problems that we are having because we are moving to the marginal areas which are very fragile and degrading them. And the result is serious gullies and landslides in those areas. Um, another thing uh, actually came as a result of trying to tackle desertification, where invasive species were, like prosopis were introduced, and they, are, they actually became a, a menace. And in fact, we had a very serious uh, human rights and uh, animal rights issue that went to high court, and these goats actually went to high court to, uh, uh, to present its case that there was nothing to eat. Uh, not, nothing to feed on after what I asked, what I mean, after prosopis was introduced. And then we have also been having a problem of uh, uh, water hyacinth, where in Lake Victoria we had very serious issues with, um, um, with the fishing industry. Um, another thing that has been causing uh, land degradation is poorly planned, planned and, and coordinated development. And this, is, this can be shown using satellite. Uh, in this area, um, there was serious concentration of boreholes such that uh, all the pastoralists concentrated the animals in this area instead of dispersing to these other areas. And you can see this area is very green while this is becoming bare because the, the, the planning of the development was not proper leading to serious de degradation. And then this one is actually self-feeding. And you can be sure if they, they decide to, uh, to sing other balls next to this, there will be more serious issues. Now, the other issue is mainly uh, inappropriate policies and legal frameworks. Um, um, we have some very nice uh, uh, programs that were even started by the colonial government, but because of some inherent pro problems, um, you find that um, in today's world, they don't work very well, and you can see, like for example, the what we call the sh the, the Shamba system um, policy, where you have a non-resident um, cropping croppers, um, people going into the forest, and where where we have harvested trees, they they try to plant trees, but in today's world, where people want to, want to produce a lot of food. Uh, instead of taking care of the plants, they actually cut the roots, and then uh, things don't go right. So consequences is 
a serious problem in terms of uh, land degradation and uh, facility of uh, um, areas uh, that ought not to be silted. Um, food insecurity, after all this, is mainly uh, we have a almost geometric increase in food production while population is increasing. This gap, uh, more mouths to feed, we've got to do something. And then we have um, a pervasive food insecurity problem that is um, a food. So um, we have uh, several um, control um, measures, but what I want to point out is that whatever you do, you need to look at mainly market-based uh, interventions because they really work. Um, for example, um, with the water hyacinth, instead of fighting it, we decided to start using it as a fertilizer, making baskets, uh, making live roots to the people. And also for the prosopis, now we are producing a lot of charcoal and all that. So I can see that. Uh, and then multiple approaches. Uh, you use whatever means possible, and then you make sure that in the loop of events, you have policymakers who are assisting. I'm very sorry uh, we have to end here because I can see Ephraim is really becoming restless. Uh, challenges, um, we have limited data, um, which we, we want to make sure that we fill in the gaps. Um, market failure and missing markets for valuations, because we need to have values in the, in the models that we are going to run. And uh, flexibility is required in terms of funding, if, if we can have something. One of the major things that we intend to do, and Varad is here, is to make sure that we validate the NDVI uh, index uh, through uh, several, several steps that she has to take so that uh, whatever results we eventually come up with will be uh, uh, dependable and accurate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wellington. Now I'm not gonna invite questions here on this uh, because uh, we are running out of time. So I'd like to invite uh, Hodge uh, Treacher and also um, Matimu, no, Rebecca Ohome to, to please come in front uh, for the panel discussion. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Georg Deichert. I work as a GIZ uh, development advisor in the field of rural development and agriculture and agriculture economics. Uh, I'm now based in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, uh, but fairly, only fairly recently I moved to the Sustainable Land Management Project. Uh, and I would like to share some of my views with the limited experience that I have now. I think it's a very interesting papers uh, we heard this morning uh, on the sustainable land management uh, process and the need to do something. Uh, I think Ethiopia has been cited uh, during the last few days uh, quite often already as a more like a success story. 
and I think I can I can share that. And uh, to my view, uh, I think the points have been mentioned also why I think that is uh, considered a success story. I would I would highlight the, the points that uh, I mentioned earlier in my comment. I think the participation of people uh, to involve in, in sustainable land management is one of the very important uh, issues. I mean, we know that this importance from many years working in rural development as well. And I think that is also part of the success uh, in, in Ethiopia. The, uh, the second biggest success factor I find is the ownership and the political will of the government. And that is also an ex good example in Ethiopia, I think, where they have embarked quite some years ago, I understand, and the, the whole program is a national program run as a SLMP. And we as a project, we just come to help and support the national uh, program. But the ownership and the leadership is coming from, from the political level. And I think these are very two important aspects. Now, what we are working at the moment, uh, I think the technologies have been described also in many presentations, what can be done, and I think it's often, it has to be very site-specific. But I think the, the challenge that we still have also now is to make it sustainable, that the SLM measures are also sustained. Uh, and there, also, the, especially the, the last speaker uh, embarked that uh, the importance to look at markets. That means we have to also not just rehabilitate the areas, but also continue with uh, production, agricultural production activities so that the people can sustain their livelihoods. And I think here the question is, we cannot just do the same agricultural production that we have been doing, because that has been partly responsible for the uh, degradation. As was also mentioned, you know, you unsustainable agricultural production is one of the cause. So once we rehabilitate, we cannot do more of the same. We have to do something different. And I think here we come into the questions, how can we do more sustainable agricultural practices? Uh, we had a big debate, I think, yesterday in the group where it talks about uh, organic farming, organic fertilizer, and how... But I think there are technologies that uh, available that can do it differently than we used to do it before. Another uh, question is that we are trying also, uh, there's also the question how can we make it a, a more adaptive to climate change aspects, because often also it's just related to increasing uh, challenges of uh, climate change impacts. And here, of course, the, the, the term climate smart agriculture is also in the, on the agenda. Uh, so we also have to should try, when we do agricultural production activities under the rehabilitated areas, also to have them climate proofed in a way. Not that we do the same mistakes again as we did before. Uh, and of course, it has to be market oriented so that the people can have a, a living out of it. One more additional aspect is that we also now try to involve uh, forestry as well, not just agriculture in, in the Ethiopian case, uh, with, an, with an additional component that we're having at the moment to promote uh, participatory forest management. Because many of the people also in the degraded areas, they also still have living close to forest or whatever is left from certain forest areas. So we're also now trying to integrate the utilization not just the protection, but the utilization, uh, sustainable utilization of, of forest in the area as an additional life, livelihood uh, component. Maybe I'll leave it uh, with this at the moment to stimulate the discussion. Maybe if I give us uh, your comments before we invite our open floor for discussion. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Rebecca Homer from Industry of Agriculture and Stock and Fisheries in Kenya. I'm in the Policy and External Relations Directorate as Acting Director. In Kenya, what I would like to say is that efforts on conservation or prevention of land degradation uh, were very immense during the pre independence days. And I think the notion about the uh, conservation was taken 
like it was a, a punishment during those days, before the independence. Lard used to be very well conserved, but I think after the freedom, people first of all felt like this uh, conservation of soil is not something that they should do. But efforts, however, in the 70s and the 80s were, were done in a big manner. And I still remember in the 80s when we were really having, like from January to March, we always used to have a soil conservation, three months of just doing nothing else but soil conservation. Later on, I think the policies kept on changing as time went on. But in the recent past, there have been serious efforts in, in conserving and, and reducing that degradation. It's only last week that we launched the Africa soil map, Kenya soil map in, in, in Kenya, where we are looking at all the different types of soils in Africa, Kenya included, and trying to see how the soils in the different regions are in an effort to work on them and see what the, each and every type of soil requires, what type of soils we have, what type of nutrients. So I think this is a hard mark in terms of Kenya having launched this, this map. So we have uh, our permanent principal secretary launching this, uh, this event. I would think the increase in the population growth has been quite high and uh, there has been a movement of people moving from the high potential areas and moving into areas which are very fragile, particularly in the, in the very steep slopes. You find that areas that don't, cannot support any meaningful living, people are on them. So, as some of the speakers mentioned, poverty is something that is very, uh, is something that is causing this kind of degradation. Because, and also exp uh, population explosion, because uh, for a country that 80% of the people would die on agriculture in our country, everybody feels that they must be farming. So uh, even the areas that cannot uh, sustain any kind of meaningful farming, you still find that people are trying to earn a living out of it. So in a very, very steep slopes, it's a big challenge as to what the government should do to remove these people from those steep areas that need not to be uh, having people, and where people are just cultivating, even when you really expect nothing out of it. This is a big challenge in the policy making that the government has to contend with. Forest and land has also been due to probably also policies of cutting trees and raising some kind of income has also been something that has caused the degradation. But efforts in the recent past have also been made in trying to afforest the areas that were degraded in the, in the past. And we have also seen some lakes, like, like maybe some of whom may have gone to, like Naivasha, which was even losing some water because of degradation in the upper slopes, now getting much more water than it was before because of efforts to afforest the land. We find that efforts have also been made in soil fertility. I hear like a soil fertility that our usage of fertilizers has been very low compared to the world average. It has been very low, but efforts are really being made to make fertilizers cheaper. So the efforts that are also being made by the ministry is how we can also be able to have some inputs and make fertilizers for our country so that the farmers can be able to use a bit more of it to increase productivity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, speakers. Uh, we, we have run out of time for discussion, but uh, we still have time in the, in the, in the, the, the next session and I would like to just make a point that the next session is very important. Given that we are doing modeling and some other aspects which are very interesting. And the big thing is we are adding value to what we already know. And you are going to see the kind of presentation that is going to come in the, after, in the, in the following session.
to be quite important in the, far, in the, in the sense that there is new data that uh, we are generating and uh, Bao is going to present that and then Ho Yang is going to present the, the modeling part. Maybe if you hear modeling, you get scared, oh, I'm not going to understand that. No. The presentation is going to be very accessible and it's going to be interesting. And mm -hmm. Stefan Schmidt is also here. His department is the one which is supporting this work. He has not spoken yet, so don't miss his talk. <laughs> <laughs> so please take five minutes and then you come back and then we're going to continue with our this next session. I'm sorry that I did not invite questions and comments from you after uh, the, the, the panel discussions, but I think we still have time and I believe that we're going to make time so that we can have the general discussion at the end of the session where we can raise any question that we want. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We'll see you in five minutes. Thank you.